Imagine, just for a moment, that you were born emotionless, with a small crystal shard in your hand. Would you care? Would you investigate it further? Would it become an obsession? Endlessly searching like those people that chase their genealogies back to the time before humans existed. Maybe you'd found an annual convention for the emotionless, crystal-loving, but ultimately like-minded, battle-hardened and experienced hungry gentleman. Well, if you were and are interested in any of the above, congratulations. You're a light warrior. This is how you start the game. You're spawned into a field with seemingly careless abandon. There's a town above you. Slowly you realise that your characters are actually standing in a field populated with various goblins that wouldn't mind skinning you alive. Backstories that cover about as much as the minute array of equipment your characters are wearing and quite possibly a red mage. The main thing you need to know though is that the world is dying. I know it's crazy shit. Thankfully, our god does not appear. Let's go check in on town, shall we? It looks peaceful enough. You gain the courage to push up, but as you do a random encounter is triggered against five enemy goblins. Your party basically has nothing, so you proceed to fist each goblin into submission. It's slow, but hey, the worst thing they did was knock your black mage down to 15 HP, right? This shit's easy! You run into the town, beaming heavily from your victory, and discover the shops for the first time. They have that shiny sword you know warriors be been eyeing up for years, and it's a bargain! There's that shirt that Black Mage wanted to wear to the annual convention next year, and a big hammer for the vaguely androgynous White Mage. You're happy to have customised your starting party. Happy about giving them lovely new weapons and staying in that four-star inn you'd heard so much about. Ecstatically, you stroll towards the field again, but a huge hulking guard steps in your way. Warrior wants to kick his teeth in. You can tell from the look in his eyes, but White Mage intervenes, settling the sword-wielding psycho. Now the guard seems interested in you, not because of the half ounce Wed Mage has tucked inside his tunic, or the illegal collection of weaponry in your general area, but because he, in all his incredible foresight, has picked a day, of all days, to partake in random light warrior checks. Now you see, the day you wandered into Cornelia just happened to coincide with the kidnapping of the princess. A dangerous vocation in gaming, I know. It seems Cornelia's entire army have failed to rescue said young royal from the clutches of an evil knight terrifyingly named Garland. The king panics, as all good fathers would, and decides a prophecy is the best political move. With the Light Warrior's entirely coincidental discovery, they're summoned to his castle and he sets about explaining the situation and the deal he wants to cut. There's no promises of gold, power or concubines, no real motivational speech, just a single promise that he will commission a bridge to take you to the other side of the river where higher level random monsters reside including dead horses to beat. One could argue that the king is just having a laugh. I mean, sending a small group of barely equipped level 1 characters to assault a guy that just dealt with the entire Cornelian army could be attributed to madness, or even a bad breakfast. In theory, it sounds quite the fool's errand. Thankfully though, your party haven't graduated from the old school of intelligence recently. So we have a game. They opt to silently and emotionlessly agree by cut pasting their crystals above their heads. They do that a lot actually. So here's your first challenge, one that introduces the main portion of the game, grinding. In order to become stronger, one must fight an insane amount of times per level. Often before you can explore an area, you'll have to spend a while mowing down enemies just to stand up for five minutes in the deeper depths of the dungeon, where enemy encounters have a habit of triggering mere steps apart. Though survival can often be ensured by the supply of potions. Garland is pretty easy with a fully equipped party, and his dungeon drip feeds victory to you. But by the time you take your first tentative steps into the Earth Dungeon to kill a generic vampire, you'll realise just how much games have progressed in the many years since the NES release of Final Fantasy, having to retreat back out to town and then going all the way back through the dungeon again to fight a bigger boss is just a little bit of a piss take. The game mechanics don't really change throughout the whole quest, it's the same thing all the way, eased slightly by the gradual addition of exceptionally overpriced gear and magic. Most will play on to meet the legendary Bahamut in order to be granted advanced jobs, like Knight, Ninja, Red Wizard, Black Wizard, White Wizard, and Master. Class changing was EXTREME to the max! 
back in the days of radical Saturday morning cartoons and cereals that turned your milk bright green. Anyone who wants character customization has only one real option. This is to save before level and repeatedly switch off and gain the level until their stats raised by that one extra number. Magic is however customizable to a degree, with three spells learnable to each tier for each character. All classes with the exception of Monk can use magic at some point due to the class change, limited only by the tier they can reach and a few certain exclusive spells. For a red mage in particular, this creates a dilemma at every magic shop. Should he learn to cure or nuke? Maybe a debuff, or that interesting new buff you've been eyeing since White Mage cast it on you last week? It's all up to you, and your character's roles. The game's difficulty is rather madcap. Certain sections are very, very easy, while others require intense patience and the medical supplies of your local hospital in their entirety. Enemies love to attack you at every second step in some places, where the encounter rate seems totally broken. When you're constantly bombarded by enemies that can use one-hit finishes on you, it gets really frenetic and fun, while at the same time frustrating and controller-throwingly intense. For instance, if you fail to pack any gold needles, then you may find yourself playing the part of an interesting and incredibly lifelike four-piece garden ornament set when you're attacked by the squadron of seven cockatrices hanging around in the volcano. Each have a chance to petrify you on touch. It's steadfast in that part of your childhood when games killed you because they felt contractually obliged. This kind of old-school thing could quite easily get you off, though. Story-wise, this is probably the weakest incarnation in the series. The characters have the acting skill of a heavily stated Sylvester Stallone, and the flamboyant villains aren't much better. The narrative itself is also quite simple and generic, featuring the world being threatened by elemental disaster after four fiends interrupt mana flow from the planet's elemental controlling crystals. Ultimately, it goes into time travel and endless loops. Sound familiar? Yeah, I thought it might. Though most of this can be forgiven when you remember what hardware it was developed for initially. For the time, the story would have been an immense epic that threw that princess right out of the other castle. Players who have only recently become fans of Final Fantasy may be put off by the lack of commands and the significant lack of any real Final Fantasy staples like Sid or the Chocobo, though it does have an airship and seafaring vessels. While the oceans here have a disturbing concentration of pirates, Many elements of the game will be familiar to those that have seen Final Fantasy IX through to the end, with many of the main bosses and key items reappearing in the tile. If you're hardcore enough to enjoy the old-fashioned exploring, then you're in for a ride. It's an entertaining game in moderate doses. It isn't, however, exactly long by modern RPG standards. Despite its weak storyline and plant pot characters, this release adds several new dungeons for the more veteran players. The ability to quick save anywhere is a well-welcome feature too. The script is much advanced over the one used in the previous Origins release, for anyone that cares, and it's certainly a superior game to its irksome spawn. If you feel your life is taking you in a direction you'd rather not, go ahead and play the other game on the cartridge. Just make sure you inform someone beforehand, as the Game Boy devalues quickly when recovered from a body. Other than the extortionate PlayStation Portable rendition, that's it. Until the next time Square grabs the premier Final Fantasy's teats firmly and creates yet another conversion anyways. How many extra dungeons does one need?